Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us dealing with a loved one with memory loss. On today's episode, I have a fantastic conversation with a woman by the name of Pam Montana. Pam was diagnosed with early stage, early onset Alzheimer's on July 20th, 2016. Her kids and her husband were with her at the time when 15 research physicians and interns let her know that she most definitely was not going crazy, but that unfortunately she did have Alzheimer's. Getting this diagnosis, she said, was somewhat of a relief because she knew something was wrong and it took quite a while to get a diagnosis and she was just relieved that she was not going crazy. Now at age 62, Pam spends her days doing absolutely everything she can to hold off the worst symptoms of this disease for as long as possible. She is extremely positive, a fantastic advocate for the disease, and I think you'll find this conversation um, uplifting and inspiring. So I'll tell you about me, um, because I don't remember how much we talked about that on the phone. I remember your mom. Something about your mom. Yeah, my mom is 75. Her birthday was in January, so she's just 75. Okay. Well, my dad passed away last year in March. We had to move her into a memory community. Yeah, okay. So, I do remember that. Okay. Um, she doesn't have any short-term memory. I don't think she has much long-term memory, and if she does, it comes and goes. Yeah. Mostly goes. It's pretty common. Yeah. My maternal grandmother had a brain aneurysm that leaked for... I think about three months, which is not a good thing for your brain. Mm -mm. From after they repaired it, she, I don't know how much time between the surgery and her memory going bad was. And I know my mom thought it was the memory loss was due to the the damage from the aneurysm leaking. But when I talked to her doctor, he said no where the blood touches the brain, that's damaged, but it wouldn't get worse. Well, Mm -hmm. she did get worse. Mm -hmm. So she probably had some form of dementia. Yeah. Oh, definitely, because she, you know. I think everybody does at some point in time, honestly. I mean. Well, my paternal grandmother will be 100 on Wednesday. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with her. That's good. Other than mostly blind from glaucoma. Yeah. And (laughs) Henri. Yeah. I tell people Henri, and they say, oh, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, which... That's why I tell my friends, you people are all weird. That's why I like you. (laughs) (laughs) And then I know that my maternal great-grandmother also had no memory at the end of her life. Okay, so So you have a lot of it in your family. And how old are you? I'm 51. Okay. So it's not a a good... No, it's not. But, you know, there's... I mean, there's a lot you can do to stay involved and to stay active and to... I mean, there's nothing we can do to cure it right now, but there are things you can do to continue to, what do I want to say, kind of keep things at bay or do everything that you can to, oh, what's the word, to kind of hold it off for a while, for example, you know. Yeah, prolong it. Prolong it. That's a good, that's a good word. And, and that's, so that's there's, there's very specific data on eating well, exercising, um, doing things you love, making sure you're surrounded by social activities, uh, doing uh, jigsaw puzzles, Duolingo, you know, um, is a Spanish app, coloring or anything where you have to concentrate, Sudoku. So you need to, you know. You can't do we, Sudoku now. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and the, the other thing that's interesting is you don't want to do anything that you don't like because that will just kind of bum you out and it, uh, you know, annoy you versus doing the things that you enjoy that are also going to hopefully prolong a potential diagnosis. So if you don't like to bike, then don't <laughs> bike, you know, walk. Or if you don't like to walk, then, you know, run or bike or do the elliptical or do fit to, to, 20 minutes of jumping jacks. All you have to do is get your heart rate up. 20 minutes of jumping jacks. Well, it's all about getting blood into your brain. True. And it's really, really important to do that. Well, fortunately, I was on a different path. My dad was diabetic. There's a lot of diabetes on my dad's side of the family. And I'm a portrait photographer. That's my other career. Okay. I had a client who was a doctor at the time. I was very, very overweight, and she said, you have a family history of diabetes, you're overweight, you're screwed. 
And I'm like, I'll Thanks show you. Yeah. yeah, I was like, you know, well, I don't like being overweight. So that was an easy, well, it wasn't an easy solution, but it's much easier than other options. So I just became very determined to find the path that helped me lose weight. And I did. I lost 100 pounds. Oh, wow. Good and I kept you. 90% of it off for four years. Yeah. And then I hit 50. My dad ended up in the hospital. He ended up on hospice. He died. With my mom in memory care. That was after losing an election, and I also broke my collarbone bike riding in 2016. So we had about 18 months of bummer. Yeah. And, you know, now it's, I got 15 to 25 to take back off, and I'm working on it. Yeah. Um, So I... Well, you know how to, it sounds like you know how to do that. Eating right is very, very important, making sure you don't get any mercury in your fish and things like that. That's easy for me. I hate fish. The mind diet, M-I-N-D, is is a really good diet to follow. Whole grains, you know, quinoa and brown rice and lean meat. You know, we don't eat red meat very often at all anymore, and we eat a lot of fish and a lot of chicken. And a lot of chicken. A lot of vegetables and kale and, and, you know, spinach and arugula and that kind of thing. But there's a ton of information on that type of stuff and about, well, along with, you know, the 10 warning signs so people can be aware, there's also information about what to kind of continue to do in your life so that, again... It, it's hit or miss who's going to get this disease. None of us know why. No one in my family had Alzheimer's, and here I am at, I was 58 or so when things started happening. So it's, you know, it's important to take care of yourself anyway. And I found it fascinating that the most, the thing that my doctor said was the most important when she was giving me that long list of, you know, span, learn a language and, you know, blah, blah, exercise and yoga and all that, that's great. And mindfulness, meditation, all that is important. Imperative, quite frankly, it's for all of us. In my opinion, I'm a huge fan of taking time out, time for yourself, starting your day, you know, with meditation, prayer, whatever your thing is, ending your day with it, being able to center yourself when you're in a stressful situation. But she said the most important thing really was to do what made me happy, because I don't like Sudoku either, and so I've never even tried to do Sudoku, but. I love to do I love to do puzzles and I love to try to learn languages I'm not good at it but I enjoy it and I like you know coloring in the color books where you have to do intricate things because it's good hand eye coordination I and find stuff like that so I like coloring first off I'm a creative person but I like coloring because it's it's relaxing yeah yeah and I think that's what she was saying and I'd never heard do things don't do things you don't love. It's really important unless it's unless because you're I mean, there are certain things you like, have to do anyway. Well, here, <laughs> shall I? I don't feel like making dinner tonight or something, but that's a whole different story because you know it's all about the brain. It's all about the chemicals that are on in your brain when you're happy and euphoric and excited and looking forward to it and all those kinds of things that just keep all that going. So there's a lot of data on that. I will as have well. to look that up because I know I read quite some time ago that they think. A lot of Alzheimer dementia patients have had mild depression for years. And my dad was a frustrating person, and he was kind of a negative, not kind of, he was a negative person. It feels a little wrong to talk about him now that he's gone. But that, that was the case, and I know there were things my mom wanted to do that he was not interested in doing, and so she had a lot of frustration. Not sure she had depression, but I think the, there's a very fine line between the two. And maybe, you know, now what you're saying, doing only do things that you enjoy. And we all have to do things we don't well, love yeah. because, you know, it's life. we all, most of us work for a living or well, I did work for a living, I'm not working now. But and so there's certain things about my job I didn't love. And then there were a lot of things I did love. And I really tried to find jobs that I knew I would enjoy 99 or 98% of the time and hire the right people so that they would be, I would have a great staff and I would have a good people surrounding me. And, you know, same with friends. I don't hang out with any toxic people. I never have. I don't, I'm very upbeat. I'm a, you know, I'm an, I'm an extrovert. I'm, I'm, I like to have fun. I like to be, do things and laugh and you know, enjoy my life. And so being around people that bring me down 
now I kind of have an excuse. Yeah. But before, <laughs> I, I would just kind of tolerate it at times. But Well, let's take a step back. You said you were diagnosed at 58, 59. I started having symptoms about 58, 59, around 2012. And we, I was living in Chico at the time, and my husband and I moved to back to Danville. He had been living in Chico, and I, uh, we, we've only been married five years. So anyway, I'd, I'd been living in Danville for a long time, and when we started dating, after a few years, I moved up there for a couple of years, and then my whole, all my family, and my, you know, kind of the core of my life is around the Bay Area, and. The, I worked at Intel for over 17 years, and the headquarters is in Santa Clara. And so we moved back in 2012 and got distracted with a bunch of other things. But at, but it, at, in 2012 was when I started noticing things. And I, I was working with a naturopath, a, a homeopathic doctor, and she asked for a very extensive blood panel. There's this company that she works with. It's called Boston Heart Diagnostics. And I'm mentioning it because they give you literally a pamphlet like this thick on everything that's going on with your blood. It's unbelievable. It's crazy. And she said... Sounds fascinating, too. It is. It was, yeah. And she said, you know, you have one of the genetic markers for Alzheimer's, APOE3. And I kind of started laughing. I said, oh, well, I'm kind of, you know noticing some things and you know you're in your 50s and things just change anyway you know going through menopause for women and stuff like that but I really took note of that word and no one in my family had Alzheimer's I didn't really know anything about it but I just you know it kind of stuck with me and then like I said we moved back to Danville and got sidetracked with everything and then around 20 I guess it was 2015 I really just made a decision that I needed to go to the doctor because I definitely was noticing things and what was happening was I was really struggling with learning Mm -hmm. and at Intel every you know week every month is you know a new technology a new a new system a new partner a new program and I managed you know a big team I was traveling up to Oregon quite a bit and I, I just was like, what's going on? Like, why can't I go to the training and or go to a staff meeting and then be able to share information with my staff without writing down almost everything I, I, I heard? So I was getting to the point where even in my one-on-one meetings with my staff, I was writing down what they said hmm. so that I could remember so that next... And also... You know, like if I was, because I manage a sales team, so if I was checking up on how they were doing, then I would know, oh, how's it going, Kelly? I remember last time we talked, you were, but there was none of it sticking, and which was new. Now, I tell this story to people, and they're like, oh, I'm always like that. Well, that's great, but I wasn't. Yeah, you know, so please don't dismiss my symptoms. Yeah, that's what drives me crazy. Did you have doctors dismiss that? A little bit, um, not not the specifics I got into about the learning, and I was struggling with numbers, and I had almost five of the ten warning signs, in a, in little bits and pieces of it. Because again, it was it was early on, and so I went to my G general practitioner, and he referred me to a neurologist, and that took a long time, and then she, when I met with her. She, you know, she's like, oh, you seem great, you know, you're lovely, and this and that. And then I said, well, I, yeah, I, thank you. But, you know, yeah. there's some other stuff going on yeah. here. Not, you're but, the neurologist, not the fashion yeah, police. Yeah, thank you. You like my shoes? Awesome. Great, you know. <laughs> and so the she did do a test, a, a, a general question test. And it wasn't really the subtract, you know, the numbers, because the, the Alzheimer's test includes, you know, start at 83 and subtract 5 until you get to... 20 or something. Did they let you use paper? Because I would no. have to use paper. Yes, no. And There's I don't, no paper. Yeah. yeah it's hard. Yeah, I was say, I, I would have hard. a hard time doing that now. It's hard, yeah. So anyway, I did well on, you know, the, what day is it and what season is it and, you know, who's the president and all that kind of stuff. And then she started asking about me, me about my education, and I remembered where I went to college, but I forgot where I got my master's. Hmm. And she was very calm, and she's like, well, okay. Well, can you describe the building? And I said, well, I was in an extension class. It was George Washington. I mean, now I remember it's George Washington University, but at the time I didn't. And so I'm like, it was in a building. It was in Pleasanton. 
she goes, okay, well, I'm going to refer you to get tested by a neuropsychologist, like to go, you know, spend a full day of testing. Ugh. Because there's no, there's no five-minute checklist and you get a diagnosis right. with Alzheimer's. It's a very, very extensive process. So I met with him, and that took quite some time. It wasn't like the next week. And that's why people say it's take, it takes them a long time to get a diagnosis. It's because of the time between doctor appointments and referrals. Yeah. And then, you know, and long story short, he diagnosed me with mild cognitive impairment, which is a really big deal. The, world, the word mild messes people up, but MCI is huge. In my support group at the Alzheimer's Association, there's people with MCI, and my neighbor has MCI, and she's way more messed up than I am in some regards. Not messed up, but you know what I mean? Yeah. For forgetful and repeating. But anyway, he recommended that I get an MRI. Well, then that took another X amount of months, and then what happened, which was a key, key point for anybody who's listening or reading or whatever is you should never go to the doctor alone ever because I don't know what I don't know I don't know what I'm not saying or repeating that's true or what day if I asked him what day it was or if I asked my husband what we were having for dinner 25 times and so when he started coming to the appointments with me it changed everything because then he could kind of share his side of the story and so we finally got referred to UC San Francisco Memory and Aging Center. And we went in there and did some basic testing and then got referred over to the research side of things. And that's where they do like really extensive testing. They did an MRI, they did a CT, they did a PET. They shot me with radioactive dye so they could see the colors of the brain and see if there was amyloid plaques or tau proteins in there. And, and you know, long, long day of cognitive, you know, everything you can possibly imagine of, of testing memories and recognizing people's faces, just all kinds of stuff. I can't even remember what it was. <laughs> it's probably a good thing. <laughs> so that was 2016. And then it took them a really long time, another few months, before they officially gave me the diagnosis. So it, around, I, th- I want to say April or May, I had to take a leave of absence from work, from Intel, because it was just getting too hard, and I was just too, I was getting flustered, and I didn't want to mess up. And I'd always had, you know, great jobs and, you know, good executive support and, you know, managed a lot of women's groups and you know, women at Intel and was a career advisor, all kinds of things. I was doing all uh, managing or shuffling or whatever you want to call it, you know, several balls. And so I, I took a short-term disability leave. And then it wasn't until June of 2016 that I got the official diagnosis when all those doctors that I had met with and all that came back and they took us in this big conference room at UCSF all these doctors and interns with myself my husband and my two daughters and yeah you know it wasn't good news when they all were there yeah probably not I didn't except I was frustrated because it took them a long time (laughs) yeah that's not that's not but they needed to explain they they started by asking me some questions about my childhood and if I was left-handed and forced to be right-handed and if I was clumsy and falling a lot and a couple other things that I don't really remember and the answer was no I wasn't clumsy and I've always been right-handed and you know but again they're you know we don't really know what causes this disease yeah and so they're really and UCSF is at the top I mean they are one of the top research hospitals in the world and so after that diagnosis, then I, you know, had a, cried. Yeah, <laughs> sure. My husband and I cried, and my kids and I cried. And then the next day, I just was like, okay, now we finally know. Because, again, it had been a few years, you know, with with testing and appointments. Can I, I ask was a quick so question? I was glad to finally know, yeah. I'm sure. What what was the reason, if you don't mind, that you were going to the, was you said, Nath? Naturopathic. Oh, oh, she was always my doctor. I'd always had her as, a, okay. as my doctor because I had a thyroid. Um, I've always had low thyroid, and I 
they I wanted a natural naturopath medicine for her, and she I I went to her every week and got glutathione, which is known to help people with Alzheimer's and with what's the one where the uh, mice are a little thingy by uh, thingy bites you the tick bites you oh yeah oh Lyme disease Lyme disease and so that was a weekly that was a weekly thing and it obviously didn't really it didn't hurt me but it didn't help me it didn't cure yeah. me but it's it has been known to help with your immune system and and you know there's toxins and stuff like that did she suspect something is that why she wanted the huge blood panel or was that just part no, of No, that was because of my thyroid. Oh, and, okay. And oh, I know what it was also because of my cholesterol because I've always been really active. I was majored in kinesiology in college and ran track and all that and very active. <coughs> Excuse me. And she couldn't figure out why my, why it was high, why my cholesterol was high. And so that's why she ordered the blood panel. And it's free, which was nice. I mean, it it's a really really like I said, very good comprehensive study that they do sounds but that doing that was pretty um remarkable well, remarkable is the wrong word that was a big that was kind of the start of hmm you know like okay well that's the the, the genetic marker showed up there i'm starting to struggle at work you know kind of things like that all it all led to my husband bob and i really starting to push and I wanted to go back to the thing about having him with me because he, we had, you know, we go to Hawaii every year. We have a condo. And when we were there, I guess I was a mess. Mm. And I was repeating myself and asking him the same question over and over again. And he travels for work. So we didn't always see each other every day. And I traveled up to Oregon quite often. So he wasn't necessarily seeing me every day and every night in order to see the progression. But we were together for two weeks, 24-7. And so he, from that point on, we I've never gone to the doctor without either him or one of my kids because they all can speak to what they're seeing because I don't know what's yeah. different today than what it was like last year. What's interesting is we suspected, I suspected, my sister, who's almost five years younger than me, and my daughter, who was a teenager at the time, all knew something was wrong and because of my grandmother and what I knew of my great grandmother was like mm, this isn't a this isn't a good sign my mom was very good at hiding it mm-hmm. and I know I'm not sure what year it was but my dad sent her doctor a letter that said I'm worried about her memory didn't hear didn't hear didn't hear went into the office with a copy of the letter nothing the woman just blew him off mm-hmm. and in 2008 my mom went through all the testing to become a kidney donor for him and she had a neuropsychologist tell her she was fine and I wished I was with her because I would have punched him straight in the face yeah, and said no she's not because yeah. I think my daughter was 16 at the time and she knew something was wrong with my mom she mm-hmm. we had a photography studio together the three of us <clears throat> and there was we they retired in April of 05 Prior to that, there was quite a number of instances that were very concerning, and as a business person, you can understand, she would take orders from clients and not write down due dates, not write down directions. It would just be yeah. Mrs. Smith and photographs in a bag or, you know, whatever. You would, you'd be like, what am I supposed to do with this? So I got in the habit of always checking up on her, which was... You know, that was definitely a sign because you shouldn't have needed to do that. Right. Yeah. And then there was one day I always got there first, which was frustrating because they lived less than a mile away and I was 20 miles away. I got there first and I was going through all the orders. We had um, employees that would finish orders, but they wouldn't trim the photos. And you know, it was like they're done, but they're not 100 percent done because they weren't all packaged and ready to go. So that was kind of frustrating, but I was taking care of that, and there was, yet again, an order, no directions, no nothing. So when my mom came in, I asked her about it, and she said, well, I don't know, that's so-and-so's handwriting. I'm like, uh, no, this is so-and-so's handwriting. That's this is yours. yours. Yeah. And yeah. they weren't even similar. Yeah. She and I had similar handwriting, so you could maybe mistake the two of us, although it was similar. It wasn't that similar. So that's when I told her, I'm like, you know, I'm getting concerned 
You used to have some daffy moments a couple times a week. Now you seem to be having them a couple times a day. And that's when she said, well, I don't want to end up like my mother. And I was like, <laughs> Well, then why don't you get some help? Yeah, well, she didn't. Because right. I found out. Right. And that's the frustrating part because, at least for me and probably for you, too, because I, why would you not want to know? I mean, knowledge is power, right? And, you know, Aricept is the only medication, Aricept, Namenda, uh, and then an Exelon patch, those are the only three medications right now, but they are known to slow the disease down. And so why not slow it down? You know, I mean, there's no cure, and, you know, it is a terminal illness. And it's the most expensive terminal illness, oh, yeah. far above cancer and everything else, like I said. But why not do everything you can? And I don't, I don't judge anybody that doesn't, but at the same time, there's so many resources. There's so many people. There's great groups you can get involved in. You can, you know, be you can be an advocate and, and speak to Congress and Senate, and you can talk to your California legislators. We just had Advocacy Day not that long ago, and there's a National Advocacy Forum coming up this summer in D.C., and there's the Alzheimer Association. You can get involved in the walk, and you can raise money, and, you know, without money, you know, yeah. there's no cure, <laughs> so why not, why not do what you can to... Well, that's, that is one thing that surprises me, and I might try asking her, not that I think I'll get an answer, but just to see if it pops out maybe, mm -hmm. because it is frustrating. It's like, maybe she did what she thought she could do, and I know, and we're talking, they retired the you know basically April Fool's Day 2005, so that's 13 years ago. A lot has changed in 13 years, and maybe she just didn't have the greatest medical advice, because I thought she was officially diagnosed after she was rejected to be a kidney donor for my dad. And she was rejected for cognitive impairment. But I found out just the beginning of this year that she was officially diagnosed in September of 2011. She wow. was 69, and, and she, she flunked with flying colors. Yeah, so she, she was didn't really tell anybody, yeah. We knew, and the other frustrating thing, like I said earlier, you know, we had about 18 months of bummer. I think my dad hit a lot of it. The last time... It's common. Yeah, and, I, and I've and i not been male. I, I don't understand that other than the... You know, it's his, just protective. They, yeah. It, the men and women both do it for their spouses and partners. It, and even women and women or anything. You know, people want to protect and they think it's... You know, they don't want to... Again, there's some shame and maybe they think that they're to blame for not whatever. I don't know. I don't... Again, that's just my understanding. I don't... Yeah, it's... He, he was... He and I are very similar personalities, or were. It's kind of strange. Uh, I'm not sure how to word that now that he's gone, but... I used to be a lot more negative, but I've worked on myself. And doing this podcast, I, the, it started because I was looking for information, and I would... I would read stuff on the internet until my eyes were blurry and watering and, and, you know, I'd have a headache. And I'm like, you know, for the people who have their loved one at home who have to take care of them 24-7, they don't have time for this. And I really enjoy listening yeah, to Yeah, the caretakers are really, yeah. I mean, it's hard enough dealing with my mom and all of her stuff with her being in a memory community. And then when I visit her, that's, you know, that's not you know go to lunch and no it's it's not fun it's yeah it's there are times when i i just want to like streak out of the parking lot at full speed and, and other times it's not so bad but i started looking for a podcast that would explain you know some of the answers i was looking for and i couldn't find them so i've i've talked to so many people now i just still don't understand why she wouldn't have been like you. It's like you said there's ten things you should do, and we'll get over those in a second. But it's like even my dad was kind of like a problem it's, solver. It's from my understanding, and again, I mean, it, you know, the Alzheimer's Association would have the data probably, but some people, uh, you know, again, I think it's it's shame or embarrassment or they want to pretend that it's not going on. And so instead of seeking help, instead of calling the 800 number, instead of reaching out and getting content and, you know, reading information, 
and you know what to do next. I mean, we have a whole the Alzheimer Association. I say we because I'm on the national board now and the local board, and you know, we'll just all this stuff. So it's like it's like my new job. But <laughs> we have a lot of information, a lot of really nice. valuable information for family, for you, but also for for her or for you to read on her behalf to help her get her affairs in order, and and to you know do the things to do and not to do to keep her comfortable and and happy if possible, and you know when to reach out for for you know, a, a memory facility or a home. And I am I hope, that's why I'm as active as I am, is I'm trying to make sure that everybody knows that does have the disease or thinks that they do, that to seek help as soon as possible because there are so many things that you can do to kind of prolong it and to keep kind of that happy, you know, happy life balance for a while until it until you're at the point where you know, you don't know what day it is or you don't know anybody, that's a whole other story. I don't know what that's going to look like or how I'm going to feel or anything else. But in the meantime, let's try to help the cause. Let's try to help other people. Let's try to find a cure. Let's walk. Let's raise money, all that. Let's take a quick break and hear a message from our presenting sponsor. Sponsors allow us to bring you this podcast free of charge every week, something we absolutely love to do. MBK Senior Communities is dedicated to being the preferred senior living provider in the markets they serve. They create warm, inviting living spaces in desirable locations. They offer a variety of services and programs to enrich the lives of residents and their families. And by getting to know their residents, their personal preferences, and their individual needs, MBK Senior Communities can better contribute to their well-being and provide care that's right for them. They are committed to enhancing independence and quality of life, serving others the way they prefer to be treated, and providing care that is delivered with integrity, dignity, and compassion. Currently serving the Western United States, but expanding. Why not contact your local community for a tour and see for yourself why most of their residents say they felt at home from their very first visit? You can get more information by visiting their website at mbk seniorliving.com or call 949-242-1400. Which I think if my mom been, if her disease happened 10 years later, she probably would have been more along those lines. I don't, you know, like I said, my dad was diabetic and he had the donated kidney, so he had chronic illnesses and, you know, I'll never understand it, and I, I don't dwell on it too much because that would just frustrate me, so that's pointless. Yeah, yeah. Um, Fortunately, he did get the finances probably about as straight as you ever can. Uh, we've rented out their house, and between that and her Social Security and my dad's investments, we should have enough money for her for 20 years. Yeah. And her mom died at 91. That's, that's <laughs> remarkable, honestly. If a lot of the people that I've talked to that are in your situation or and I don't know that many honestly because I'm on the other side I'm dealing with people that have Alzheimer's like I do I I have some that some friends and family that you know have the a relative that's that's getting there or, or you know is, is older but usually it's the other way around where they have to keep them at home and then they have to almost quit their job and yeah the cost of caregiving is extremely high I, I don't have the data with me but I can tell you because we, we, we had just, to have 24-7 caregivers when my dad was on hospice. Well, before, when we knew he was coming home to, to back up, we I saw my parents November 1st, 2016. We went out to lunch. And my dad wasn't physically great, but that wasn't new. And he seemed tired, but also not super unusual. He didn't sleep well. And he seemed mentally fine. And then I texted him on election night, mostly because my husband lost. And then we let we left the next day for Jamaica for my 50th birthday. We were gone for 10 days. When I came home, I called him and discussed Thanksgiving. And we made arrangements to get together the Tuesday after Thanksgiving uh, to, you know, visit, put up decorations for my mom because I knew that wasn't something he physically feel up to doing and my husband showed up my husband my father thought it was 1998 
So we went immediately into panic mode. And if I had known what was going on, if I had known he should have been on dialysis, which I knew he didn't want to do, and I was his health power of attorney and I'm my mom's health power of attorney, I would have just taken my mom home and left him there or called hospice or something. I'm not exactly sure, I would, have, but I wouldn't have taken him to the hospital. He was there for a month, 32 days, and they finally kicked him out. And he seemed better. He had a gap in his memory, like almost like a hole. And he was very anxious to fix that, replenish mm-hmm. those memories. And they were telling us that it was possible, and, which was unfortunate because that gave my sister a lot more hope. Um, I am on the more on the negative side, and so I, I was hopeful, but very cautiously hopeful. I'm like, yeah. you know, they've been telling us for a month that his mind should get better, and it really hasn't. So let's hope, but that was where I was at. So he fell. He ended up different hospital. My husband and I were sitting at the table, and he said, well, I wonder how many times this is going to keep happening, Dad falling and ending up back in the hospital. And I just glanced up at him and I said, it's not happening anymore. And I was like, oh, my goodness. I guess I made a decision, and I had to get my sister on that page. So that was that was where all of that was. It went, and it was really hard to all of a sudden have two parents with no no functioning memory at all and while he was on hospice his friend told me well you know Chuck just assumed that Diane will live with you well at that point I didn't even have a spare bedroom my photography studio is attached to my house you know I work from home I I don't have the space or in my life or in my home to take care of my mom and I thought wow you know I just turned 50 and you know he expects me to just you know this is probably going to sound really horrible but I felt like I was expected to throw away this part part of my life where I should be really enjoying things my Mm -hmm. daughter did move out February of 2017 and you know it's just my husband and I are three golden retrievers it's like you know I can't imagine being responsible for my mother you know, a hundred percent of the time, and and her dog. <laughs> That's a whole other story. So there was no planning for what would happen with her, what we needed to do with her, what what options there were if he went first, and that was likely. So that was that's the other reason I want to talk to people, and I have been about you know what the heck should you do? You've been diagnosed. You've dived into doing all of the things that the doctors recommended. You're doing advocacy and volunteering, which is also good for you. That's that's my goal, is to help people like me and you and family of mem- family members like us just to like to take the better path. Yeah. I see so many people that yeah. are not. And and part of what you're talking about that that list of what's important to do, not on the you know get involved in the Alzheimer's Association and join the board of directors and all that kind of thing but the preparation Mm -hmm. so it's really important to do it now for me right because I have I again I don't know how many years I'm going to make it so to speak and if I was 80 already I think I would have already had everything all set up so I have had a will and, and, and trust actually for years and I've and I have had a a power of attorney and a DNR and, you know, all kinds of stuff. So we just did a couple of tweaks, met with our financial planner, and then also met with our lawyer and made sure that my husband has full power over my health decisions. And I've also made it very clear to my family that I don't want, I want to, you know, kind of go peacefully. I want to be at home and I want hospice or whoever and I would love for them when the time is right, if I'm just kind of laying there being a vegetable to just give me some extra morphine and, you know, say goodbye to me kind of a thing. And I don't know how legal that is or if that can even happen. But I currently right. Well, it's, it's interesting you say that because I, I'm actually going I, I'm behind schedule on this, I'm going to do an advanced directive and I'm going to take it to an attorney that can certify I'm in my right mind. Mm-hmm. And then I'll basically say, if I end up like this pull the plug Mm -hmm. it's there's no point when when we first moved my mom into the memory community I felt horrible because I felt like we were just warehousing her it was like we're just paying all this money just because we didn't want to deal with her which wasn't really true my sister 
has school-aged children. She works full-time. She does have a flexible job. It's a commitment, too. I mean, it's you've got to live your own life, and when you have that burden, then it affects you and your husband and your kids and your your work and your own salary and income. And that the recent data that came out talks about the cost of unpaid leave. Yeah. I mean, unpaid leave. Unpaid care. It is ex. Extraordinary. It's I can't even remember what it is. It's in the trillion dollars. It's, yeah, this is this and disease this is, is so expensive. Over, yeah, yeah. And you know, just between caring for people like my mom, you know, you're not old enough for Medicare yet, are you? No. Yeah. So she is. You know, and I I know from Medicare statements from my dad, you know, just the millions of dollars spent on him between dialysis and kidney transplants and hospital stays and everything, and never even. Yeah, contemplated my mom but you know just you know the memory community and you know I used to work I I go to the gym and I go to Rotary on Mondays and I go see my mom so I used to work after after Rotary on Mondays I don't do that anymore I mean I can if it, I have to but I'm the kind of person that needs kind of a regimented schedule mm-hmm. or else, you know, part of being self-employed, you have a lot of flexibility, but then yeah. you also have to be equally as flexible. And I don't want to say, oh, I'm going to go see my mom on Thursday, and then the next thing you know, you're doing something else, and oh, you haven't seen her for two weeks because yeah, you know, she doesn't remember that I've been there, but it's... Well, it's important to you to... Well, and, you know, either I've had no issues whatsoever with the staff or anything, but... I do try to shift it up a little bit because sometimes if we don't have a meeting and I go early, they'll say, oh, you're early today. And it's like, yeah. <laughs> How do you know? Yeah, yeah because I'm there. Why are you watching? <laughs> yeah, because it's almost all the same. It's within the same hour every week. So it's like I'm sure somewhere between 2 and 3. If I'm not there by 3, they're probably looking at their watch wondering what's going on. So that could lead to if they know that I'm coming – what are they doing differently? Yeah. yeah. So if I, you know, and I don't know what, you know, I know my sister goes on the weekends. I don't know if it's, I know she's not as regimented about it as I am because kids' schedules, I'm not sure that's even possible. So it helps, yeah. but they don't get as many visitors during the week, during the day. So it helps if I can shift to a different day. But tell me the 10 things that you, well, can you back up and tell me the, tell me the warning signs? Well, the 10 warning signs, I don't know them by heart. Okay. But I'll look them they up. are um, confusion with time and place, you know, forgetting people's names. Um, I think there's a spatial thing in there. Um, not knowing what an object is. Like if I thought this was a phone and it's a, you know, it's a cup. Um, putting things in places where they shouldn't be, such as putting your toothbrush in the refrigerator instead of in the bathroom, things like that. And then I think there's something in there around around increased agitation or something, but I'm not really sure. They're, they're, all, they're all very much documented, and so there are examples, which, again, is why getting online and going to ALZ.org and, and really, you know, printing all that stuff out or going into the local office they all have all that kind of at their fingertips i'll definitely look that up yeah Um, it's interesting i have a very strange vision so i don't have depth perception i never have yeah so spatial is not great and i'm not good with names unless i've heard your heard or seen your name and your face multiple times Mm -hmm. it's um i think it's more of a right brain artist thing because that's also my whole yeah i mean a lot of people you know a lot of people don't do well with names that's not a very good example it's it's you know it's kind of but if it's anything that's new it's anything that's different if you've never known names and no names isn't a big deal but if you've always known people's names or if you've always been able to you know ride your bike or tie shoes and then now you can't that's different that's a change so the biggest thing that I tell people is to really keep track of what you start to struggle with or where you you know kind of forget words or repeat words or don't know the meaning of a word or use the wrong word so for example if you were going to talk about how angry you were and and you're going to say oh I was really frustrated and instead you say like oh I was really delighted and you think delighted means mad you know what I mean Mm -hmm. instead of and so there's some things like that 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 they that's that's documented 
That's interesting because I don't think, you know, looking back, and we actually think my mom may have started exhibiting symptoms in 1995. And remember back, I said she wasn't officially diagnosed till September of 2011. So that's a long period. But she didn't ever seem to have big changes. It just seemed like her memory just kept getting worse. Yeah, and that happens. I mean, it. It. I mean, I probably had Alzheimer's for 15 years. That's what they or, say. You know, before I got before I really started noticing the symptoms, and I'm just grateful I paid attention because I think some people don't. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that there are people out there that have Alzheimer's or some form of cognitive impairment, and they are not doing anything about it, and so they're not getting the help that they could be getting or get involved or get on medication or get in a trial. I'm also part of a clinical trial. Without trials, there's never going to be a cure. We have to have a, you know, we, we have to have people go into a trial with all the big drug companies or little drug companies so that we can find how to, how to deal with this. So being part of the clinical, tri- clinical trial for me right now with Roche and Genentech is a big commitment in my life. It's every four weeks and it's, it's in San Francisco and it's for three years. So I'm again doing what I can but they're, they're, not everybody can get into the trial too because the, the rules are so strict so yeah and you, there's trials for people that don't have Alzheimer's for different which are great too because you know then we're that we're having like a baseline kind of thing so it, everybody can get involved I guess is my message yeah I've, I've gone to trial match I just I have a lot of stuff going on so I haven't jumped onto that too much yeah I think it was the very first caregiver support group I went to there was a gal from UC Davis the research arm and she was super excited after hearing my little bit of my story because they are doing um, studies on people like me but yes. it was just one problem they wanted you to be 65 and I'm like nope oh. I just I think yeah it was November too young. <laughs> yeah I'm like yeah I just turned 51 Not she's gonna like work. darn I'm like my mom has early onset Alzheimer's you sure you don't want me well and that's <laughs> that's that's the deal and it's you know I'm sure it was like this with cancer and AIDS and you know all the other things and you know muscular dystrophy I mean you name it that there's you know everything has to be so kind of rule driven or you know scientifically studied it can't just be some random oh that works not really yeah you know and so it there are some really strict parameters there that that make it hard. I almost didn't make it because even though my thyroid is at the level that my doctor is fine with, it was out of the trials range. Wow. And so I had to reduce my thyroid medication, which was fine. And it, nothing, I don't haven't noticed anything. I've been in the trial now. I think I'm on infusion number 10 or 11, so almost a year. Um, and but it took a long time for me to get the right dosage to get me to the level that would allow me to be in the trial. I was devastated. I was more devastated by not getting selected for the trial, I think, than I was with the diagnosis. <laughs> That's interesting. Because I knew I knew something was wrong with me, so the diagnosis was sad, but it was like, okay, good. Now we know. Great. I'm not going crazy. Yeah. Right? And then, But with the trial, that was like my way of helping and my way of doing something. And so I was just devastated that... But I, I, we've got it fixed. Got, it's all good. Yeah. Well, I'm going to keep on the trial match. So what is what is every day? What does your everyday routine kind of look like? You know, every day is different. There are some things I do every single day, though. I go. I wake up in the morning, and I grab. I make an espresso coffee on my little espresso machine, and I go back to bed normally. Sometimes I go sit on the couch and I journal, and I write down what I had done the previous day from what I can remember and I write down how I slept and how I'm feeling and how what my mood is and all that kind of stuff and then I write down I just you know I write about what happened the day before and how I felt about it I just you know I'm just kind of present in the moment with keeping track of things and the one of the first women I met when I just got diagnosed said make sure you journal because you won't remember what you did and you won't remember what you did six months ago and you'll have the journal 
to go back to, you'll always have kind of a record. And so it's a really great way for me to start the day. And I don't have any filter. I mean, I literally am just writing whatever comes in my head. I write it down and I, and I have my coffee and then I do a meditation every morning. And then I'm a big Christian, very strong Christian. And I decided this year I was going to read the Bible cover to cover. (laughs) So I have a Bible study book that I'm doing. And so I try to do that. And then I usually, you know, get something to eat, go to the gym. That's where it differs. Every day is different. Some days I go to yoga. Some days I just go, um, you know, use the treadmill. I have a group once a week. So every Thursday I go to group at the Alzheimer's Association in Lafayette. It's a support group. My husband travels for work and sometimes I'm able to travel with him. Um, I, some days I have board meetings uh, or to prep for a board meeting or an event. I have a lot of people that have been kind enough to, you know, come up and visit and take me to lunch or, you know, have lunch dates or things like that. So you and, get out of the house? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm out of the house. Almost. I've never stayed in the house all day unless <laughs> I was sick. And then You wouldn't like working from home then? I worked from home for 30 years. Oh, okay. I've always worked from home. Okay. Yeah. No, I've always worked from home, and I've always traveled. I've been all over the world. I, I had a huge territory, and when I worked for NCR, I worked, I worked with Intel as a customer, and I went to every factory that Intel had in the world. I mean, I've been to, seriously, almost every continent, I think, other than Africa. So I'm used to being at home and getting things done, so it doesn't really bother me which I think is is a plus because if I would have had the job where I had to get up at 5 and take BART and was gone till you know, 7 at night all the time and not used to being at home, it might seem weird. Now, don't yeah. get me wrong. It do, it is, it's starting to not be weird to be home as much as I am, but it certainly was initially because I was up in Oregon my, recently with Intel before, you know, before I had to leave, which was pretty devastating. I... I I was, so I was on medical leave for a while, and short-term medical leave, and then I went on long-term medical leave, and then I, I retired. They, they kind of forced me to retire because I didn't really want to, I'm but, sure. but I kind of had to because I, I couldn't come back to work, and I was retirement eligible, not by my age, but by my years of service. That's a benefit. So that was a, that was a sad day, kind of, but it also you know happy day. I don't know. It was kind of this really weird emotion thing going on. It was really hard. To turn in my that. laptop and, you know, my phone yeah. and just all that kind of stuff. Well, it's definitely so, the end of a chapter. And yes, those are always hard. It was, yeah. And you weren't prepared for that. Like, no. People was, plan on, I mean, no. my all my friends are older than me. And so they're, they're talking about, you know, planning for retirement and this, that, and the other thing. And some of them are retired and many of them are retired. My cycling group, most of them are retired they, you know, I, I just laugh. I'm like, I don't really have a retirement plan right now because I've been self-employed, you know, since 1991. You know, I worked with my parents, and then in yeah. 2003, I started my own version of the photography studio because I knew our lease was up in 2005 and they'd be retiring. So, you know, and my husband's a, a realtor. So, yeah, it's like, yeah, okay, work, die. That's kind of our, real, our, yeah. our retirement plan right now. We're working on fixing that, but, you know, it's just interesting because I enjoy everything that I do. You know, for, photography is it's a very quickly changing and not in a great way industry because of cell phones and oh. all kinds of stuff. You know, people just, it's not a priority. And even when it is, sometimes, you know, mom's like, I really want to do a family portrait. And I guess society has changed where if, if my mom had said she'd want to do a family portrait, that would have happened. If I say I want to do a family portrait... I had to wrangle my daughter and her fiancé a little bit more because they're not super interested in it, but they will do it. Not necessarily with giant smiles, but they will do it. But I have clients whose teenagers kind of veto certain things, and I'm like, why do you allow that? Yeah. So, you know, I before the whole 18 months of negative, I was looking for something different, but having worked from home and having the flexibility, it's like, well, I, I don't want to do that, and I'm not going to commute, and I'm you know, it's like, right, right, where yeah. am I going to go from here? And then this whole, you know, thing with my mom and trying to find... And you have the flexibility now, yeah. Yeah, and, it, you know, obviously, you know, it, was, it took a while, because there was a couple of years I kind of was wondering what my purpose was, and I knew my purpose wasn't to be a full-time caregiver, because that would not work. 
I have one child for a reason, mm-hmm. and I have three dogs, and one of them is slightly feral and wild, and there are days, he's, we've had him three months, he was adopted at seven months, and he was in a pen in a backyard with his brothers, which is why he's a little wild, mm-hmm. but he jumps our fence and runs in the hills behind my house, which he did last night for over two hours until it was dark, and I finally got the wire cutters to cut the barbed wire fence at the bottom of the hill so I could go on the property behind us. I guess I won't mention who owns it <laughs> to get the dog, but he was he was tired by then and finally decided he was coming home. So yeah, I, never a dull moment. Oh, no kidding. So, but it's, you know, a, what a, not cut out to be a full-time caregiver. Yeah. I, you know, my that's okay. patience I mean, is not, it doesn't extend... You know, when you when you're going through the terrible twos with your kids, you know that's going to end. But when you're going through the same kind of thing with your mother, yeah, and you know it's only going to get worse, it's a little bit harder to, yeah, just muscle through. Like we had an incident this week. We I I do her and her friends nails, and that's what I was doing Monday, and we were waiting for nails to dry, and thankfully my the the rooms are set up. They're they're large private rooms with a Jack and Jill bathroom. And my mom's neighbor, who is in her 90s, late 90s, I believe, it's hard to know because she tells you different ages all the time, she fell. And so I went in, she fell on her side, and I went and I sat her up and leaned her up against her couch, and then I had to go get a caregiver because thankfully my brain kicked in and I realized I shouldn't pick her up. So I went and got the caregivers, and... I came back, and my mom and her friend are trying to wrestle this poor lady off the floor, and I'm trying to get them not to in case she's hurt. And, of course, they didn't understand, and my mother gets very cross with me. She was very unhappy with me trying to tell her what to do, but I was afraid they'd hurt her because I wasn't sure what was, you know. I didn't think she was broken, but she's very frail. She's a walker, and she was complaining that things hurt, but she wasn't crying or anything. So I'm like, I'm sure she's okay, but we're not going to make it worse. And, you know, they did take her to the, you know, the emergency for x-rays and stuff because they weren't sure if she'd bumped her head. And you can't do the concussion protocol with somebody who doesn't remember stuff. So it's, it was interesting because, you know, the, the care was top-notch. But dealing with my mom and her friend, who were just trying to help their friend, they were trying to do the right thing, and oh my goodness, it was crazy. And then they had like five firefighters. I'm like, are you training with some of these guys? Why? You, this woman is like 90 pounds. It's like there's no reason you need all these guys here. But I, yeah. I kept the my two out of the room so that you know, it wasn't crazy. Kind of but it's yeah. you know, there's always something. There's always a resident that needs something. Sure. And I, sure. I help because, you know. I mean, that's why that's why they're there is because they need help and support. And, right. And but some of it's like one time the there's a gentleman there, and he wasn't getting the signal on his TV. So I went through all the TV inputs except antenna because that didn't make any sense to me in these days, day and age. And I know it's hooked up to cable. And, you know, I played around with this TV and did everything I, I knew how to do and couldn't get that to work so I went and got one of the staff and she said oh that happens to him all the time and then she said it was antenna and I'm like okay well now I know the next time he asks for help I'll be able to help yeah you know they have enough staff but it seems like whenever somebody wants something they find me and other family members have asked me how much I charge to do manicures and I think I missed missed my uh, opportunity to charge Make a few money. yeah for real i should have bucks hundred dollars <laughs> yeah no they don't pay. i'm not that good but you know it's just it's some extra cash <laughs> yeah i should have done that but it was um interesting so what would you suggest to people in your position besides you know just i would definitely say to get involved and to reach out to the alzheimer's association and and find something that fits with what you enjoy if you don't really like to be in a group and you don't want and you you know you don't really believe in like counseling or support and you don't feel like you need support there are th- still other things to do i think yeah. the main thing is just to realize and recognize that you're not alone that you're really not alone and that there are it, it, the balls in your court you know you you choose what you want to do what you don't want to do 
you know, the walk events every year are very inspiring, very fun. It's, you know, most people really, um, it's easy to have people walk with you and raise money and, you know, do matching t-shirts or matching hats and make it into a really fun day. And if that's the only thing that you do, that's great. But it just depends on who the person is and what they're, how willing they are to kind of put themselves out there. It, it, it's all about them doing, again, what makes them happy. And if they don't really want people to know or if they have shame about it or if they want to just sit at home and do their thing, then that's that's their choice, right? I mean, what I'm doing isn't what everybody wants to do. But if you want to get involved, there's just tons of opportunities. And just yesterday, one of my friends in the support group spoke on on TV, I think it was Channel 7, and, and was interviewed um, by, you know, by the, by the television for things that, t- you know, to talk about what's going on. Well, not everybody wants to be on TV, but if you do, people want to hear your story. I hope people saw that and saw that Chris, his name's Chris is just a normal guy with, you know, that can still put a few sentences together <laughs> and, and speak. And, you know, Maria Shriver is very, very involved with her women's Alzheimer's movement, and there's things you can do there. This June, we're having the Women's Alzheimer's Movement at the Equinox Gyms. It's one day in San Francisco, and I don't recall the date right now, but it's a great opportunity to get the, the uh, ex- exercises specifically for mind, you know, for things for, for your brain, for keeping your brain active. So they'll probably do a little yoga and a little cardio and some things like that. They're having brain-healthy snacks, and then they're having a panel with some uh, scientists and other folks from UCSF and other places. So even if you just go to that or you go listen to the panel or you raise money or you you donate to the cause so that, you know, there's a vendor that can, I don't know, there's just so many things that, that are out there. Do you feel, feel like there's more stuff out there now than 10 years ago? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I I wouldn't know that, though, because 10 years ago I didn't... Wasn't on your radar. Wasn't on my radar at all. But I think so, absolutely. And maybe because that's my job now, my life now. (laughs) But, you know, you go on Facebook, you go on Twitter, you go on LinkedIn, there's, you know, there's, uh, there's articles, there's people, there's commercials now that every 66 seconds someone's diagnosed with Alzheimer's 65 percent are women people know the facts people are starting to learn the data and so I think it's I think we when I tell people I have Alzheimer's they're surprised but there's nobody that says what's that that's that's good because but it's also I think it's left out kind of left over from you know maybe what they grew up with or what they thought but the, you, you might have seen the movie Still Alice. I've heard of it. I, I'm it's really to... good. Really, really good. But she had a Is very... It sad? Really sad. Oh, okay. But it's That's very why good. I watched it. <laughs> and a woman with Alzheimer's helped, you know, work with the director and all that. And she had a very unique kind of younger onset that m- moves very quickly. And I just have the kind of vanilla Alzheimer's, which is great. So <laughs> hopefully I'll make it for another five to seven years. I don't know. We'll see. Five to ten. But... Um, we'll see. But I wanted to mention something earlier when you were talking about my day because it's really important that you have people that can take can be with you when you are home alone. Mm-hmm. And even if you're su- super functional, which I am, I consider myself really, really still pretty functional. And that is the help of my kids. And with my husband being gone, they have really made accommodations and come over and spend the night and take me to dinner and so do my friends and I think that's really it's you know it's a it's a testament to really surrounding yourself with people that that really do love you and you and that you can lean on because we need it we all need it and whether you have Alzheimer's or not you need it but when you have Alzheimer's you really need it and you it's really nice to know that I could pick up the phone and say can you come over tonight or I you know I need a ride to the hospital can you take me to the hospital next week or you know whatever it may be and I have you know a nice list of people that I can reach out to and they 
every time I meet with someone, they're like, well, what can I do? How can I help? And I'm like, well, donate to my walk or, <laughs> or come walk with me or, you know, come over and have coffee or let's meet at Starbucks. So, so you feel like when your husband's out of town, your daughters come or your neighbors come and spend the night a lot or all the time? Um, not all the time, but pretty often, not my neighbors, but yeah, my kids or my friends. Yeah. Yeah. And then, do you have grandkids yet? I do. We have six grandkids. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Our youngest is barely one, and the oldest is ten. Okay. And two of them live nearby. They're seven and ten. And yesterday, that's where I was. I was with uh, at school with the ten-year-old, and he was George Washington in a, in a two-and-a-half-hour play about the American Revolution. And it was Ooh, just a commitment. So, oh, it was so fun. It was so wonderful. I oh, that's with, good. I didn't go with his mom. I went with um, his aunt, my other daughter, my my younger daughter. So, we're very active in their lives, and and we try to get them, um, you know, by ourselves at our house. Matter of fact, they're coming over on Sunday for a few hours. So, and, and they, they know they they they're sad. The oldest one's really sad, and he's trying to make a difference and has written a blog and oh, that's awesome. Trying to raise and he's money. Ten. See, it's like there's so many positive things. I know. And that's what we need to focus on because I think, you know, my mom was more positive, but, and she still is. So I just, maybe one of these days, all the little pieces will click together as to why it, because I'm convinced if she was diagnosed 10 years later, for real, not 2021, but, you know, because like I said, she flunked those tests with flying colors. I think she would be more like you. She would have, you know, changing the way she eats would have been a challenge because my dad was a terrible eater. But that's one thing my husband and I have done. We have stripped, like, as many chemicals out of our life as possible. We bake our own bread. Yeah. Our meat's hormone-free now with, you know, some of the chicken that isn't always. But at least half of the meat we eat is hormone-free. Yeah. Well, look at the Mind Diet, and and I bet you're doing some of that already, but, I mean, it's important, you know, for all of us, but, again, with your... With my lovely history. With your lovely family (laughs) history. You might as well do what you can. Well, I did tell my almost 100-year-old grandmother several years ago that I got the fat gene from her side of the family. Yeah, thanks a lot. (laughs) And I better not have gotten the dementia gene from mom's side of the family, because that would just be completely wrong. that's not fair. And she looked at me, and this, you know, I'm thinking this was like three or four years ago, so she wasn't young by any stretch of the imagination. She just looked at me, and she says, well, you won't remember if you do anyway. And I thought, holy crap, this 90-something-year-old woman is throwing shade on me. And I just laughed, and I thought, well, she's right. She's true. It's true. (laughs) I know. And I think, you know, I truly believe laughter is the best medicine. I'm, I'm on a mission to get on the Ellen DeGeneres show because... I never had a chance to watch her, and I mean, I know her, obviously. Yeah. So I've seen all the movies, and obviously Finding Nemo is all about... Yeah, well, she was the, Dory. Or Dory. Furry, finding, finding Dory. Yeah, Finding Dory, which yeah. is all about a fish that doesn't have a memory. I'll have to watch that, because yeah. you know, my daughter's yeah. 26. I've kind of fallen out of the animated movies, although not entirely. Oh, it's a really good movie, but she really... You know, going back to doing what makes you happy. When if I'm having a bad day or I'm just tired or down and out or just whatever, not in the mood or exhausted from the gym, she just lifts me up. I mean, she's just so funny and her show is funny. And so I've always I decided because I never watched it. I mean, I was working full time for you know since high school practically, so or college I guess. But um, I wanted to I wanted to thank her. So we'll I don't know. That's my one of my missions is to be able to talk to her and thank her and let her know her impact on on me and our family. Have you written to the show? We have. And okay. we've sent videos cuz I've spoken, you know, several times. There's I have videos all over the place. I did a PBS special and I whatever. I've been I saw that one. Did you? Yeah, I've done quite a few different um, videos. I've done quite a few different things for the Alzheimer's Association and spoken at events and Excuse me. Uh, I just got an award a couple weeks ago for the, from the Alzheimer's event at a an, you know, spoke there, and so anyway, there's clips of it, but she probably has every day, she probably gets 500 people that yeah, want to be on her show. probably, or more. But it's okay, I don't, it's okay. It well, they do have Elderly it. Wish. Pardon? They do have an Elderly Make-A-Wish. It's, it's called Elderly Wish. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, so co- contact them, because maybe they can help muscle that oh, that's into happening. I'm going to write that down, I've never even heard of that. I don't think I had until, like I said, I've learned so many things, talked to so many people, I was going to tell you, talking about doing things that make you happy and, you know, 
I interviewed an author yesterday who has written a book called Stop Acting Your Age. (laughs) And, you know, he talks about how laughter, you know, it brightens your face. Oh, it's so important, I think. Yeah, Yeah. well, it makes you feel good, too. And when you feel good, you know, I mean, he comes at it kind of from an actor's perspective because that's what he's done all his life. Yeah. And he will be 80 in October. So he says he's he's mentally 68 because his wife won't let him be 15 years younger than his biological age, which I thought was funny. And it was a very interesting book because it talks, you know, there's a lot about, um, you know, positive attitude and living optimistically. And And I've always been that way. I mean, honestly, I think it came from my mom and my, my, our religion growing up and our faith in God and knowing that everything happens for a reason. And my mom was really friendly and really kind and... At the time, it kind of annoyed me because I was like, why are you talking to all these people? And, you know, I, but I just, I think I am more her daughter than the rest of the kids. I'm the youngest of four in our family. And it's definitely, it's just who I am. I mean, people you ask people, you know, what I'm like that say, oh, she's really funny and really nice. Or, you know, I mean, I don't know what they'd say, but, you know, right. that I'm just, they wouldn't say like, oh. Oh, it's kind of a bummer. Yeah, I don't want to be right because I'm a goofball. I mean, I you know I act probably younger than I am or whatever. So I'd rather have that than. Well, I vowed many many years ago because you know, and understandably with the chronic illnesses that my dad had, he was a negative person as a personality, and then all of that stuff doesn't help. And we actually had an employee who was older than me that he just. He'd get on my case if he thought I was complaining. And I would say something, and he'd be like, why are you complaining again? And I'd be like, huh? I'm not complaining. So it frustrated me that he would think that I would make a comment that I think I kind of thought was like sarcastic humor, and he was hearing it as a complaint. So I I really self-censored myself. Yeah. I think that's the right word. And kind of, I think I reoriented how I, not 100%, but, you know, if I'm frustrated. Well, we all have our moments, and I... But, I mean, you know, I think day in and day out, I'm, you know, you just go with the flow. Like, whatever happens, happens, and it's meant to be, and you just, oh, well, I guess, you know, I guess I was supposed to have this disease, and I, that's why I use it as a, as a, my new mission, my new calling, that the reason I have it is so I can help others. See, that's such an awesome attitude, too. And my mom used to always say, everything happens for a reason. She'd say that to the point where I wanted to choke her. (laughs) And then at some point I pivoted and I'm like, yeah, she's right. And (laughs) here I was looking for a new purpose and we went through all this stuff. And now I'm starting this new career, hopefully. And it's just, yeah, it's like, okay, I guess she was right. Moms are always right. And think about all the, you know, cool people you're going to be meeting along the way and interviewing and you know, whatever else you're going to be doing. I don't know. I mean... I don't know either. It keeps... I've been working on it for about two months. I'm about ready to launch and... It'll evolve. Yeah, it has. And it's been exciting. And it's... it's. I've had to learn things and, you know, there's just... It's like, oh, okay. Well, thank goodness for Google because, you know, like I said, we're both self-employed and my husband had a quiet time and this is a quiet time for photography Although not usually in March, but it's rained so much that it's not helping me at all, even though I do have an indoor studio that nobody ever wants to use. (laughs) And, you know, so I've, I've, I've done everything as inexpensively as possible, but still top quality. So that takes a lot more time and more research and, but it's been, it's been interesting and it's, and I can feel, I feel different. You know, I've been doing photography well, so have long. A purpose. Right. And I've been doing photography so long. If I didn't have to look through the camera lens, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have to. It's just, it's, you know, people that, you know, new clients that have not, they're there for the first time. Sometimes they'll say, oh, well, you know, you must take hundreds of photos. And that's just, that's no, I kind of like get a horrified look on my face because, if I do that, then I have to edit through that many pictures to find the good ones. If you show too many, people get frustrated because it's overwhelming. I know, and there's like one eye, eyelashes going yeah. in a different direction or something, and, and they look all the same. Yeah, yeah I, like I, I narrow it down to the ones that I think are the best, and if I'm not sure, I leave it both in. Yeah. And I don't show more than like a roll of film worth, or roll and a half maybe, because... People get overwhelmed, and then they stop making decisions, and then it's a lose-lose for everybody. Right, and they get frustrated and, yeah, all the and, rest. And so. I was talking to one client, and I said, I just, I know instinctively when I have enough. 
and because she had a 20 month old with her and he of course decided that was the day not to cooperate which is Picture day is always the day, yeah. And I <laughs> and said, I guess, this is, and I guess it's time. Yeah. Well, speaking of time, it's three thirty. Oh my goodness! Well, I really appreciate you coming out and talking to me today. Yeah, thank you for it's asking. It's been fascinating, and I'm very inspired that you find oh, this to be your new mission, oh, not good. not a death sentence. No, because life is a death sentence yeah. anyway. So yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. Well, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you for asking again. I hope you found this conversation as inspiring and uplifting as I did. Talking to Pam about everything she does to ward off the worst um, symptoms of the disease, all the things she does to stay positive and to make an impact in the world despite having this awful diagnosis was just very uplifting and I enjoyed her humor and her, her willingness to to give back. I hope you found this episode also inspiring and don't forget to go wherever you get your podcasts, rate and review us. Ratings allow other people to discover us and get the helpful information that I am sharing. And once again, thank you so much. And I will talk to you again next week. Mm -hmm.